Let's take you now to a very different kind of session. This features a series of personal stories of ordinary heroes who have created their own disruptions through their extraordinary deeds. This series will run in three sections. The first one is now, the second will be after lunch, and the third one later in the afternoon. Let me introduce you now to the host of these sessions, himself a very inspiring person, Mr. Rajiv Vij, life and executive coach at Personal Alchemy. Rajiv, if I could invite you up on stage, please. Thank you. CEO at 33, regional head at 36, and he left it all to follow his calling at 39. Rajiv is now a leading life and executive coach, an author and speaker. He works with leaders in various sectors to help them fulfill their leadership potential. His clients include fi Fortune 500 companies, large Indian organizations, and social sector institutions. He has recently authored a book called Discovering Your Sweet Spot, which captures his views on the path of personal mastery and transformation. In a former avatar, he was a managing director at Franklin Templeton Investments. Rajiv, over to you. Many thanks, uh, Vinika, for, uh, for that kind introduction. Really appreciate it. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'm sure we'll all agree what a wonderful conference uh, this is turning out to be. And, and alongside, I think, the conversations we are having about reinvention of the future, perhaps there is also the opportunity for us to, like we saw in the earlier session this morning, the opportunity to just pause for a bit and reflect and reconnect within with who we are and what we want our lives to be about. And in that context, in the interest of time, I'm going to straight jump into asking you to reflect on two quick questions for yourself just now. The first question I have for you is, how successful are you? And not in comparison with others and peers and so forth, but where you started in life and how far you've come. If you can think of a number on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very successful and 1 being not at all successful. So a number that best represents you. Yeah, so everyone has a number there. The second question I have for you is, how happy are you in life? And again, if you can think of a number on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being extremely happy and 1 being not really so. And I want to know, are there any people out there whose happiness score is much higher than their success score? Any hands out there? I see a really small minority, and, and thanks, thanks for that. But you know, it's, it's not unusual for me to, be, uh, to find, particularly addressing groups of successful people, that for a large majority, it's not the case. And it really begs the question. It, it kind of really deflates the very subliminal assumption that drives our everyday behavior, which is somehow if I can be more successful, I will be happier. Somehow success will automatically lead to happiness. And in that backdrop, what I'd like to talk to you today is just sharing a bit of my personal journey, trying to wrestle with this fallacy in my journey and, and the three lessons I've learned in the process. So I was you know, well set in my corporate career and business was fantastic and I was fortunate to grow rapidly in the organization and so forth. But at some point in my career, I did start to notice the fault lines of this equation between success and happiness. And I was also beginning to become quite aware of the sort of ongoing underlying sense of incompleteness within me. Somehow, despite all the success, there was still something missing in my life. And coincidentally, around that time, I got involved with some NGOs back in India in my personal capacity. And just spending time with these individuals really got me thinking that this high-flying job that I have and jumping in and out of planes that I'm doing, kind of what difference does it make? Does my existence really matter? And you know, I was reading a lot in the space of who am I, purpose of my life, and social change, and all these existential type of questions. And, and you could argue perhaps I was going through my midlife crisis. And, and perhaps I was. But I think many of us have these questions at some point in our journey, but then come Monday morning and we get sucked into the emails and the conference calls and the spark's gone. Luckily for me, it won't go away. 
Also, I'd learned some meditation techniques way back now, 17, 18 years ago, and found them really effective, both personally and professionally. But with busy corporate life, these things have become the remnants of my day. And around that time, maybe I felt a strong need for it, I revived it. Initially for half an hour, then for an hour a day. You know, whether I was in Singapore or Sydney or, or San Francisco, I would find my time to meditate. Long story short, what was coming through to me was that while work was terribly exciting for me, but being engaged in two things, you know, one, working on my own personal and spiritual growth, and secondly, of helping others, although in a small way at that time, was just giving me a very different joy. And it really started a bit of a hobby horse in my head that I wish I can create a life which really revolves around these two themes, you know, working on my own inner personal growth and helping others with theirs. And I had a bunch of ideas floating around in my mind, you know, start an NGO, introduce new forms of holistic leadership to organizations, and, and so forth. But somewhere in that search research, I stumbled into the field of life coaching. And as I started to learn more about it, it just fired my imagination. It was like, wow, this is it. This is what I would love to do for the rest of my life. You know, it, it, it was like finding your calling a deep intuitive connection that I had with it. And fortunately for me, none of my left brain analytical skills came in the way of you know, stopping me. And as that whole idea started getting crystallized, then I couldn't hold myself back. Then it was on one day, you know, three more years of this kind of a role and I'll be financially more secure. And you know, the usual questions that hold us back. And I was ready. And, and it wasn't a career shift I was making, but really a life shift that I was after. And that's how I embarked on that journey. It's, you know, as I talk today, it's been nearly 10 years since this change. And all I can say is that it's just been a blessing for me. You know, at a professional level, what started really as a vocation has become a successful business practice. But more importantly, you know, the people I work or I have the privilege of working with, when they experience significant positive change in their professional or personal lives, there's nothing more rewarding than that for me. I also get to do a lot of voluntary work coaching leaders of the social sector, and that's always inspiring and fulfilling. And at the personal level, I think I've been very disciplined about trying to live the life that I really wanted to create in the first place. So while coaching is my center of plate passion, but I still restrict it to only a certain number of, day, uh, number of hours in a day. And that gives me time to you know, meditate and exercise every day, a uh, lot of time with the family, I read a lot. I've been writing a blog, as Vinika mentioned, just got my first book published. So I have a much simpler day now, but one that I find much greater happiness and meaning in. And through this journey, I've learned a number of lessons, including about myself. But there are three lessons that I'll particularly like to share with you today. The first lesson is that when we talk about happiness, it is important to recognize that the change is within us. Very often, we tend to externalize our challenges. You know, as Sadhguru mentioned in the morning, you know, it's, it's my leader's too demanding, or my, you know, I've been married for a certain number of years and my spouse doesn't care for me anymore, or the kids these days don't listen to us, and, and so forth. Interestingly, you know, sometimes I'll go on a weekend to a friend's party and meet someone I've never met before, and I tell them I'm a life coach, and he's like, Oh, you must meet my wife. I think she'll greatly benefit from talking to you. And sure enough, as the evening progresses, and I do bump into the wife, she's like, oh, have you met my husband? Come, let me introduce you to him, because I think he sorely needs a coach. So somewhere, the subliminal, subconscious perception, belief that we live with is the source of my misery, my unhappiness, and my ineffectiveness is outside of me. The reality is, the change is within us. So the question I would ask is, is your leader too demanding, or are you not courageous enough to express your needs more fully? Has your spouse stopped caring for you, or have you stopped demonstrating your love? Have your kids stopped listening to you, or have you stopped listening to their needs? Which one's the truth? The good news is that as we start to look within and start to make the necessary changes, irrespective of the people and the circumstances around us, we start to experience a new reality. And it's not about shifting the blame or compromising. It's really the difference between, for example, looking out of the second floor of Marina Bay Sands and the 52nd floor. 
The scenery by itself outside is the same. But we have a very different perspective. The second lesson I've learned is that for deeper happiness, we need to strengthen our levels of self-awareness. Because unless we have a deeper understanding of ourselves, we get easily influenced by what's popular around us. And this self-awareness needs to be at all levels of our being, at the physical level, understanding our physical habits, uh, uh, where we tend to spend time, how do we prioritize, and so on. At the emotional level, how do we relate with others? What makes us happy and sad and anxious and why? At the mental level, really examining our conditioned beliefs, our recurring thought patterns, our biases, our perceptions. And at the spiritual level, really understanding our spiritual identity. Who are we at the very core of our being? Now this surely requires switching off from time to time from our 24-7 lives and creating some structured time for reflection. Personally, I found meditation to be greatly valuable in this regard. You know, now, like we need exercise for our physical health, we do need a reflective practice for our emotional and mental well-being. Because through a reflective practice, we really get to uh, get in touch with our recurring, you know, and particularly delimiting beliefs and mental and emotional patterns. That's how we get to learn about our tendency for perfectionism, for, for our judgmental nature, our greed, our envy, our insecurities. And only then can we begin the work of reforming our inner selves and, and building instead courage and compassion and authenticity and, and wholesomeness and, and mindfulness. Reflection also shows us how frequently we tend to put our present happiness on hold, making it contingent on some future event, like you know when I get promoted or when uh, I'm more successful, when I'll have more money and so forth. But as we connect deep within, we begin to recognize that we need to learn to be happy in the now irrespective of the perceived imperfections of our everyday life. The third lesson I've learned, and this one's been particularly instructive for me, is that for greater happiness and for a clear sense of meaning in our life, we need to build clarity about a deeper purpose in our existence. You know, working with leaders from diverse backgrounds and from my own personal journey, I've really come to believe that each one of us is uniquely gifted and has a special purpose to fulfill on this planet. But do we take the time to discover it in ourselves? How often we are on a treadmill of activity and metaphorically speaking, running really hard, but perhaps really not getting anywhere. You know, as we relentlessly strive to climb the social, financial, and, and the corporate ladder, do we even wonder, pause, and question whether our ladder's leaning against the right wall in the first place? Which ladder are you trying to climb? Is it a true representation of who you are and what you want your life's work to be about? What do you value most individually? Do you want to be more successful or do you want to make a more significant contribution towards something meaningful? Do you want more money or greater happiness? It doesn't have to be either or, but what's more valuable to you? You know, so often we get consumed by measuring our progress based on these external and, and uh, visible parameters of success, right? So the size of the house or the car or the holiday destinations or the job title and what have you. But I have a self-assessment happiness test on my website which thousands of people have taken. And, and perhaps a slightly better indication of you know, uh, our inner state of being. And, and I can tell you that for many successful people, the numbers are rather scattered. Also frequently, we get stuck in this notion of relative success. So it's not good enough how well I'm doing compared to where I started. What matters most in our minds is how am I doing compared to my peers and social network. So the person driving the Maseri C-Class is constantly thinking about the person in the E-Class. And mind you, not that the person in the E-Class is any happier, because he or she is wondering when are they going to upgrade to the S-Class. And this is how we live a poor man's life, because we are constantly thinking about all the things we don't have, rather than be grateful for all the blessings we do. And unless we have anchor, unless we have a life aligned to a clear sense of purpose, 
we will continue to experience undercurrents of unhappiness and lack of fulfillment in our life. So what is that singular theme that you would like to dedicate the rest of your life to? What is it that when, at eight, when you are 85 and 90 and look back, you'll be so glad and so proud of that you, you committed the last 30, 40, 50 years of your life to? That's something to think about. So those were the sort of bit of my journey and the three lessons I wanted to share with you. But in closing, I would add that when Edmund Hillary climbed the Mount Everest, being the first person to do so, he was being interviewed by journalists and one of them inquired. He said, what does it feel like to conquer the tallest mountain in the world? He reflected for a bit and, and said, well, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. And I think as a final thought, I invite you to consider the opportunity that each one of us has to deepen our self-awareness, to take greater personal responsibility of our thoughts and actions, and live the purpose we were born on this earth for, so that we can all discover that personal sweet spot where we not only experience success, but happiness and meaning too. Thank you.